Hey friends, I'm bringing to your attention a video put out by the Discovery Institute that is wretchedly bad. Um, and if they had any shame, they wouldn't have posted it. But, you know, Discovery Institute, they have no shame. They had no problem with it. Uh, it's titled A Whale of an Evolutionary Tale, and it attempts poorly to rebut the paleontological evidence for cetacean evolution, which is among the best evidence we have for a transitional series. Um, they also try to undermine all of evolutionary theory. And at the end, the narrator says, if this is the best evidence for evolution, what does that mean for their other evidence, which is not as good? Uh, we'll see that this video is so bad that it doesn't say much for the quality of the Discovery Institute's arguments either. In fact, they make some trivially stupid creationist arguments in this video. Uh, but first, a few general comments about the cringeworthy creationist video. It's terrible, as it goes without saying. Uh, it uses a kind of cartoonish style. It's, you know, it looks a lot, well, in some ways, not entirely, like a Prager U University. You know, the usual cheesy images presented as animation, etc., with a voiceover. Um, it's kind of awful that way. In this video, I don't do any animation. It also has this kind of tinky boop music to it. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, that kind of meandering, non-melodic noise where they just kind of rattle their instruments sort of rhythmically, maybe pound the keyboard a little harder when they're emphasizing a point. Uh, it's really bad. It's It looks like a, an ad for something. But anyway, you won't want to recall the music. And fortunately for you, I do not include any background music in this video either. The narrator makes a lot of feeble jokes, really terrible, limp sorts of jokes that just fall flat. Uh, for instance, there's a bit about his gam gam in the middle that goes nowhere, doesn't contribute to the point they're making, and, and really should have been cut from the final product. But no, somebody had to indulge themselves. Um, fortunately for you, I'm going to be terribly humorless in this video. There's not going to be a laugh anywhere. Okay. And also the narrator sounds... They picked a narrator who sounds really young and, you know, hip, like the kids do nowadays. And... Uh, no, I didn't pick a better narrator for this. You're stuck with me. You can cope though, right? It'll be okay. Okay, so let's dig into this video. The premise is that the fossil record of whales has been misinterpreted. It starts off well enough. This is a, re this is a reasonable series of whale fossils shown in approximate order. But you can tell we're going to go off the rails soon enough when the narrator focuses in on the top two specimens in the top left, Indohias and Pachycetus. And then he says what I was afraid he was going to say, and that you probably already predicted he was going to say. Indohias is dated as far younger than its supposed descendants. That's stupid, okay? There's a lot wrong with that comment. First of all, an Indohias specimen is younger than a Pachycetus specimen, that doesn't mean that one species pre precedes the others. Don't confuse the individual with the clade. And secondly, Pachycetus is not a descendant of Indohias, and no one has come, ever claimed that it is. To understand that, let's look at a real cladogram by real scientists published in a real science journal. Indohias and Pachycetus shared a common ancestor at the point marked B on the diagram. There is no direct line from Indohias to Pachycetus. Another feature of this diagram laid out in the key, which I presume is too small in this video for you to read, is the nested hierarchy of shared derived characters that led to putting the fossils in this order for the diagram. At B, for instance, it says, dense ear bones for underwater hearing. 
That character is shared with all the animals except the hippo in this illustration. At C, it says carnivorous piscivorous diet and a robust tail. That is a trait that Indohias lacks, but all of the animals above it possess. This is the logic of assembling a phylogenetic tree. Basically, all of the entries in the legend, from A to V, are a sequential list of the characters that evolved in the whale lineage. That's what we use to determine the evolutionary relationships of all these animals. But you say, what about the fact that Indohias is 48 million years old and Pachycetus is 52 million years old? That is totally irrelevant. Let's zoom in to that lower left part of the diagram. And there they are again, no line from Indohias to Pachycetus. But let's think about those dates. We'll sketch in some dotted lines from 48 and 52 million years ago. The fossil record is terribly spotty, and we're lucky to just see a few individuals preserved from each lineage. We have few specimens of Indohias. They're from about 48 million years ago. But the species Hindo Indohias would have existed for far longer than a single individual. That would be obvious if you're anything but a creationist. It's the same with the species Pachycetus, which also would have existed for millions of years, and the two species would have overlapped in time. Nothing about the chronology contradicts the evolutionary relationship of the two species. The cocky narrator of the creation of the video soldiers on, though, as if he's made a significant point. He's going to hammer home his ignorance with another cartoon. He says, this is common practice in evolutionary analysis to ignore where species actually show up in the fossil record and place them wherever makes Darwinian sense. Apparently, he thinks he knows better than the paleontologist where Indohias is supposed to be. That's a peculiar notion. No one says a fossil is supposed to be in one place in one time. Did we close our eyes to the existence of coelacanths because they weren't supposed to exist in modern times? But further, it's rather arrogant to see one specimen and then claim you know everything about the temporal range of a species' existence. The author of that video seems to think the fossil record shows a sequential record of histories. First one species arises, then it is abruptly replaced by its direct descendant, which will in turn be replaced by the next species generation. I've seen this argument before. It's a familiar classic. You all know this one too. If we came from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? Or in this case, if Pachycetus came from Indohias, then why do we find Indohias at the same time as Pachycetus? No, really, the discovery in this video is that stupid. It's nothing but a gussied up version of the old creationist canard that refuses to accept branching evolution and the existence of multiple lineages at the same time. Now, I could stop here. We've already shown how inane this video is, but they go on to make a second argument, so I guess I should address that as well. They're going to advance Michael Behe's claim that we can mathematically calculate the odds of two particular mutations occurring in sequential order, or even simultaneously. And they use that to argue that whales are too complicated to have evolved from Hindo Indohias to a recognizable swimming whale in a mere 8 to 10 million years. Since they calculate that it would take 43 million years for just one adaptation involving just two genes to evolve. You can't even get two simple mutations to occur less than 43 million years, they claim. So how can you claim that four-legged shore-dwelling animals evolved into great pelagic cetaceans in less than 10 million years? And this is where it gets messy and kind of twisty because they cite a legitimate paper to derive their estimate. They cite Durrett and Schmidt, who argued mathematically that a specific pair of mutations would require, on average, more than 100 million years to appear in humans, as the Discovery Institute highlights. They just love this stuff, plucking one datum of the scientific literature and applying it to everything, often inappropriately and incorrectly. Unfortunately for them, I can highlight the abstract too. 
And there's a few things the DI intentionally glosses over. Uh, the first point is kind of important. There is nothing wrong with Durrett and Schmidt's model, as near as I can tell. Much of the math is beyond me. But I'm willing to accept their conclusion. But what they're doing is modeling a specific kind of mutation where a short, about six to eight nucleotide, sequence of DNA that is a binding site for regulatory factors is first inactivated, and then we have to wait for a new sequence to appear by random mutations. That's a narrow class of conditions, and it also tests for the appearance of a specified sequence, a predetermined sequence, which I have to say is just not how evolution is going to work. But okay, given those limited parameters, I can't argue with their math. If evolution were waiting for predefined transcription factor binding sites to appear in a roughly specific location on a chromosome, it would be waiting for a long, long, long time. The second point is amusing. They don't mention that one of the major points of this paper is that Michael Behe is a very bad mathematician. A good bit of the paper is dedicated to showing that Behe was wrong. It's such a rejection of Behe's thesis that Behe himself had to write a rebuttal in which he stated that the Durrett and Schmidt paper was, quote, seriously flawed, unquote. So it's seriously flawed when it annoys Michael Behe, who originated the idea that two mutations were beyond the limits of evolution. But the Discovery Institute is happy to gloss over that part to cherry-pick conclusions they like from this seriously flawed paper. Hmm. But let's go further. The Discovery Institute is building on this model that claims Behe has mathematically shown that evolution is impossible, and they assert it again in this video. But Behe's calculations have been repeatedly shredded in the scientific literature. So here's an example from Michael Lynch, who also mathematically and with stochastic modeling, analyzes this problem. He is, his answer is pretty clear. So he writes, A recent paper in this journal has challenged the idea that complex adaptive features of proteins can be explained by known molecular, genetic, and evolutionary mechanisms. It is shown here that the conclusions of this prior work are an artifact of unwarranted biological assumptions, inappropriate mathematical modeling, and faulty logic. Numerous simple pathways exist by which adaptive multi-residue functions can evolve on time scales of a million years, or much less, in populations of only moderate size. Thus, the classic evolutionary trajectory of descent with modification is adequate to explain the diversification of protein functions. The paper he's criticizing was won by Michael Behe, who made the same claim the video does. He tears it apart. Uh, B, he used an ad hoc, non-Darwinian model with biologically unrealistic set of assumptions, and that to counter it, Lynch used biologically justified premises and an explicit population genetic framework. In summary, then, the Discovery Institute relied on bad assumptions, ridiculous ideas about what fossils say about lineages and time, and also on bad math by a bad mathematician to declare the impossibility of evolution. But at the end of the story, they are still left with a pressing problem. They have admitted that the data behind this diagram is valid. Different species of mammals appeared gradually in the fossil record, starting about 50 million years ago, and these organisms sure look like they represent the appearance of adaptations that progressively resulted in a 50 million year old terrestrial animal producing, in some unstated way, a fully aquatic modern cetacean. They want to simply erase all the lines in this diagram, leaving the animals just floating there in time with no explanation for their appearance or why they're morphologically similar or why the extinct extinct forms disappeared. They're just certain somehow that common descent is false and that there are no related lineages or transformation of species represented here. So what is their alternative explanation? They don't give one, except for vague hand-waving about a designer 
They're happy to erroneously claim the rate of whale evolution is too fast. But all they have to replace it is the idea that their designer poofed each of these forms into existence, which, if I need to say it, is a much faster process than slow selection over 8 to 10 million years. I look at this diagram, and I have to say that if it quacks like a duck, and waddles like a duck, and has feathers like a duck, why should I believe their claim that it's actually an angel in disguise? All right, everyone, this is that part of the video where I want to thank all those wonderful patrons on Patreon who've been supporting me recently. And it's been a real help in allowing me to make regular payments to our lawyer once a month. We still got a ways to go, but at least I'm contributing every month to that from, from the funds you have donated to me. Uh, it's also been, and this is more important, it's been vastly reassuring in this time of isolation to know that some people actually like what I do. And at this point, they'll even tip me a small amount for the work. Any amount is appreciated. Thank you so much. So, wow, look at all those names flying by. This is pretty good. Okay, I'd give you all a hug with your consent if you weren't all so far away. And if hugging weren't poor hygiene at this point in our history. But okay, I can still wave and I can still say thank you. So thank you, everyone. And I'll be trying to make more movies in the future and we'll see what we can do about that. Okay, did you notice? This is, this is key point. Did you notice? I didn't talk about spiders at all in this video. I didn't even mention the word spider once. Not one. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I guess I blew it. Okay, darn. I'll try better next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you all later.